In this section now, we'll start to introduce the eigenenergies of the hydrogen atom. Okay, so let's start with a recap. So in the previous sections, we showed that the eigenstates of the hydrogen atom can be written as a product of a radial portion, which we're calling R sub L, and the spherical harmonics. So the angular part are the solutions, or the solutions for the angular part are the spherical harmonics, and the radial part depends on the L in the spherical harmonic. And the R sub Ls will be solutions to this radial equation down here. So this is, this is the radial equation where you have what looks like a kinetic energy term and then an effective potential that includes the raw Coulomb interaction and then something that looks like a 1 over R squared that depends on the angular momentum part. Okay, and, and then there are, these are some simplified constants that are, that are shown over to the right. Okay, so when you solve the radial equation, what you find is that you can now index the solutions to the radial equation with a new integer that we're going to call n. And we'll interpret n in just a second, but for now, we'll just talk about what you get out of it. Uh, when you solve for this, you find that n must be bigger than l plus 1. Or put another way, we find that we know that l must be bigger than 0, bigger than or equal to 0, and then l will be less than or equal to n minus 1. And then the energies that you get out of this can be indexed by just this value of n. Me is the mass of the electron. You get Me times e to the fourth. So e is the charge on the electron. Then you have divided by eight epsilon naught squared times h squared times n squared. And then on the right is the same equation, but we've changed from h squared to h bar squared over here. And this changes, this gives you a factor of uh, four pi, four pi squared that you have to add in. Okay, so this big jumbly mess we're going to chop up into a more convenient form in just a moment. But first we can notice that we notice two important things about this. For first off, the total energy of this is negative. And this makes sense. Negative energies indicate that this is bound because the actual confining potential is 1 over r. And the dissociation limit for 1 over r, so the value that you get for this 1 over r as r goes to infinity, is just 0. So anything less than zero means that you have a bound particle or a bound electron. Okay, so these are negative and bound. And then the energy is proportional to one over n squared. And so what this means is that as n goes up, you can see that the energy clearly decreases, right? You have minus one over n squared. So one over n squared gets smaller as n gets larger, but then you have this negative, And so it becomes a higher energy as the n's go up. Another thing about this result that's a little interesting is that the energy depends on n. Notice the wave functions have both L and m sub L, or the eigenstates have both L and m sub L, and the radial equation depends on L as well. And so somehow, by some weird magic, the L dependence and the m sub L dependence drops out, and all you end up with is this n squared. Uh, so this actually, this looks quite mysterious, but it actually ends up being the result of some really complicated and more advanced symmetries that are at play underneath this that we won't go into to details on, but uh, there, there are good explanations for why it ends up that way. Now finally, the eigenstates or the eigenfunctions that we get out of this will have now three different quantum numbers. So we have psi of n, l, m sub l, and this is dependent on r, theta, and phi, and this is equal to r, n, l. The solutions to the radial equations are indexed by n, and the radial equation itself depends on l, and so this is a function that depends on both quantum numbers n and l. 
and then times the spherical harmonic for L and M sub L, and these are the angular dependent terms. Each of these different quantum numbers uh, gets a different name, has a different interpretation. So first off, there's N, which is known as the principal quantum number. And as you see, this is the only one that goes into the energy for the hydrogen atom. There's also L, which is the angular momentum quantum number. And then there's M sub L, which is known as the magnetic quantum number. Okay, so now the last thing we want to do is try to simplify these energies a little bit because my guess is that no one will ever memorize this gobbledygook of constants here. So the way we can do that is to start by defining a natural distance. This natural distance we'll, we'll call a naught, a zero. So this is known as the Bohr radius because it comes out of the Bohr model. So even though the Bohr model itself is disastrously wrong in certain really important respects. The Bohr radius is actually still an important quantity even for the exact solution for the hydrogen atom. And this is defined as 4 pi epsilon naught h bar squared over m e e squared. Okay, so if you plug in values for this, this is approximately equal to 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, which is approximately 0 0.529 angstroms. Now if we write this, if we rewrite this in terms of the Bohr radius, this ends up being quite a bit simpler. So in terms of the Bohr radius now, these energies are minus h bar squared over 2me a naught squared, still m squared, n squared. Okay, but now there's actually one last constant that I want to define that simplifies this even further. We're going to introduce the atomic unit of energy, which is called the Hartree, and normally written EH. And this is equal to h bar squared over me a naught squared. Okay, so this has a value of approximately 27.212 electron volts, or approximately 2,625.0 kilojoules per mole, or 627.51 kilocalories per mole, or last one, 2.1947 times 10 to the fifth wave numbers. In terms of Hartree now, the energies of the hydrogen atom are minus eh divided by 2n squared. So this is kind of appealing now, it's just uh, it's just your unit of energy divided by 2n squared and times minus 1. So there's a couple of remarks I want to make about the Hartree energy. So this is, let me point out, this is called the Hartree, which is the atomic unit of energy. Um, so this is actually the unit of energy that is used in all sorts of computational chemistry software. So, so if you ever do calculations using modern quantum chemistry software, at the end of these calculations, they always spit out these enormous numbers. Uh, those correspond to the total binding energy of all of the electrons in a molecule. And those energies are always given in Hartree. And they always end up being these kind of monstrously large numbers. And it's even worth keeping in mind that this is actually a monstrously large unit, right? So one Hartree is 27 electron volts or 600 kcal per mole, right? So remember, you know, chemical bonds are normally thought of being on the order of one to 200 kcal per mole. So numbers that are on the order of hundreds of Hartree have, are really kind of meaningless unless you unless you take, pay attention to the scale and what and what the what the energies are actually measuring. So now we need to ask ourselves, what is the ground state energy? What is the lowest possible energy that you can have for the hydrogen atom? 
And to answer that, we need to know what the lowest possible value of n is. And we can use this relation up here, so we know that n must be bigger than l plus 1. And we know that l at its smallest is 0. And so that means that these n's up here start at 1 and then, and then go up. And so that means that the lowest possible energy for the hydrogen atom corresponds to E of 1. And this has a value of minus EH over 2, which is approximately 13.6 electron volts. And now the last thing we should discuss in this section is to put these energies in context with the potential itself. So what we're seeing with this plot on the right, so this, this dark line here is the 1 over R Coulomb potential for the electron being attracted to the proton. And then we have the energies, the, the actual eigenvalues of the energies uh, shown in these horizontal lines here. And so what you see is that the gap between successive energy levels starts to shrink really fast. All right, so, all, so what you have is an infinite number of bound energies. Right, so n goes from 1 up to infinity, but as you start to get higher and higher in energy, as you start to get closer to the energy equal, being equal to zero, then the spacing between these energies gets, gets really, 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 really tiny. So there's quite a gap between E1 and E2, but by the time you start to look at higher ones, like you know, even, even between E5 and E6 is starting to be uh, really teeny tiny. Okay, so that's the major points of the eigenenergies of the hydrogen atom. In the next section, we'll start talking about the eigenfunctions themselves and what we can learn from those.